In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, O God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, who art everywhere, present and fill us all things, treasure of blessings, and gear of life. Come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls, so good one. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and to the ages of ages. Amen. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy on us and save us. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Today we will continue with our conversation about uh, the book of Revelation by um, St. John the Theologian. And this will be the uh, continuation of our previous conversation when it came to the orthodoxia, orthopraxia, that uh, orthodoxy is not just about having the uh, by name, practicing is very important of our faith. That's why we talked about the book of uh, Revelation, where we saw that the first epistle of the seven churches of uh, Smyrna, of Ephesus, and of uh, the others are the churches that we covered. Uh, we Last uh, time we talked about the letter to the bishop of uh, Ephesus, uh, Ephesus. Now we're going to continue to the second letter that's why we'll continue in chapter 2 verse 7 to 9 and later on we'll continue to uh, chapter 2 verse 8 and 11 so we're going to car cover from 7 to uh, verse 11 from the second chapter of the book of revelation we covered a lot the last time we could talk about the epidemic of the spiritual anesthesia we talked about the heliasm as a heresy and the millennialism uh, that that's another uh, let me see some people are admitting so we'll just let them get in. Uh, we covered the the topic of not just that, but also of the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans who were the basically very similar to the modern Gnostics. And we talked about Gnostics, the antinomians, which is against the, the law, where the abuse and the misuse of the flesh is a must. We talked about how that relates to the modern time. And with the help of Father Athanasius, Metilineus, we were able to kind of understand the the concept of the of the the struggle of the church uh, at the very beginning with the heresy of the gnosticism and of course we touched on the topic of the freedom what is freedom freedom of or freedom in christ which uh, freedom is true today we'll continue the same topic of course we'll cover uh, on this uh, lesson uh, the revelation from Chapter 2, verse 7 to 11. First we'll, first, we'll read only 7 to 9. And we will can start with the second letter from the famous churches of, the, of Asia Minor, those seven churches whose lampstands God removed finally in 1922 with the great movement of the, uh, the Orthodox people, the Orthodox Christians from that area because they were occupied by the Islamic countries in that specific case is Turkey. So we'll see that how important was when Father Athanasius was talking to us about this. We'll again use his guide to cover, uh, to explain and interpret in depth the book of Revelation, how it relates to the modern time. Never forget that these lectures were given by him in 1980 and 1981, which is more than 40 years ago. And uh, the things that he's speaking about then are uh, unfolding in front of our eyes today and very soon in the future will be fulfilled. That is why this book is so important. There are five volumes. And now we have the first volume, of course, The Seven Golden Lampstands, but we will try with God's help to cover everything because we will learn a lot and there is a lot of catechetical value in all of this. So let's begin. Who has an ear, now I'm starting from verse 7 to 9, who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of light, which is in the paradise of God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last, who died and came to life. I know your tribulation in your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. So let's unpack this. 
because there is a lot to cover. What does it mean? Why Christ is kind of harsh with this? What, what is the poverty he's talking about that the, Myrna, Smyrna, the, the church of Smyrna has? The epistle, to the, uh, the epistle of the Lord to the church of Ephesus uh, closes uh, with the most common phrase in the epistles of the Revelation. So, um, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. As I have said before, Father Athanasius continues, this phrase is repeated at the end of each epistle with some small variations corresponding to the variations in the epistles themselves, such as, for example, when he says uh, in, the, in the Revelation of St. John, to him who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The certainty of this victory is the victory of Christ and our faith in him. The tree of life promised by the Lord is the tree that was forbidden to Adam and Eve before they exited paradise. In fact, their expulsion was precisely for this purpose, to keep them from eating from the tree of life, thus making their evil corruption immortal. As the church fathers will explain, we know that if Adam and Eve did not die from biological death, that eating from the tree of life, and if we uh, do not experience biological death, the sin that lives in us will become immortal because of our immortality. That's why the biological death is a necessity. It's basically part of the divine plan. Even though death truly doesn't exist, it's a Passover from this life to another life. Still, but biological death becomes uh, necessary. After the fall, the doors of paradise remained sealed and shut, and death entered creation. So Christ himself, who opened the road leading to the paradise of God, offers the fruit of the tree of life. The expression, my God, is similar to what he said to the myrrh-bearing women, if you remember in John 20, 17. Let me see if I have that here. Yes. And Jesus said unto her, for I am not yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascended, I ascend unto my father and your father and to my God and your God. This refers to the human nature of Christ, of course, who opened the gates of paradise as God-man. The incarnate Son of God, Christ in his human nature, struggled, worked, and led mankind back to the kingdom of God. So what is the struggle that every Christian must try to win? Each Christian must apply himself to all the things that we discussed last time, of course, and especially in the, in the last epistle that he gave to the uh, the church of Smyr uh, uh, the church of uh, Smyrna, the rejection of and struggle against every dogmatic and ethical derailment and persistence in the first burning love. This love is the one that the Lord complained about, saying, "You have left your first love." If you remember last time we talked, naturally you understand that the Lord's promise to eat of the tree of life is directed against those who th those illicit carnal pleasures permitted by the Nicolaitans. The Lord expressed hate for their words. We said many times that uh, Christ looked sometimes at the Pharisees and those who were going against him and questioning his authority and so forth with anger. But this is a righteous anger. And this is very important to understand, not to confuse sometimes as the world portrays Christ as a pacifist, as someone who, is, who never got mad. We have plenty of... Uh, contradicting uh, uh, sayings in the, in, the, in the scriptures as well. With this, we close the first of the seven epistles from the Revelation. That's from the last Sunday when we talked about Nicolaitans. And by the grace of God, we enter now the subject matter of the second epistle, referring to the Bishop of Smyrna. So the epistle to the Bishop of Smyrna reads the following. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. I know your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich. And the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Now we are moving to the verse 9, 10, 11. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And for 10 days, you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who conquers or prevails shall not be hurt by the second death. 
All of this is very important. This is a Revelation chapter 2, verse 8 to 11. As we said previously, Smyrna was a great Greek city with a Greek name. You can see here on the map on the left, on the right side, there is like a little reconstitution in the computer graphics about what Smyrna looked like at the time. It's a very important, even today, uh, as a city, very important trading city in today's Western Turkey, but was always a Greek colony and consequently became a, a, a Christian center in that, uh, that place. It's located eight miles north of Ephesus, the church that received the previous epistle from the Lord when we talked about the Nicolaitis and so forth. And it is south of Pergamos, another church that will receive an epistle. So Smyrna was between these two cities and competed with Pergamos and Ephesus in the social, economic, and cultural sectors. In the city of Smyrna, there was a Jewish synagogue that proved to be very intolerant of and polemic towards Christianity. The major portion of this epistle will cover the intolerance propagated by the synagogue against the Christians and their bishop in Smyrna. By the way, the epistles uh, to the bishop of Smyrna in Philadelphia are the only epistles without any sort of reproof they only have compliments. There is not a single criticism, only praises and consolation. This is very interesting to point it out. The first bishop of Smyrna was Bucolos. Um, the successor to Bucolos and recipient of this epistle was most likely the apostolic father, that we all know, the hieromarty Polycarp, who was martyred on February the 23rd uh, in the year 155. This epistle of our Lord to the Bishop of Smyrna serves as a classic example for the heroes of the faith. By the way, St. Polycarp of Smyrna is someone that, I don't know if with Father Matthew we, we talked about him, but deserves special attention. I think we did. If not, we should come back to him. He wrote several epistles that are being preserved this very day. He is one of the, what we call apostolic fathers, a direct successor of the apostles. Christ says, these are the words of the first and the last who became dead and lived. The introductory phrase of Christ, the sender, who is sending the letter through St. John, the theologian, is taken from the initial vision which we previously analyzed. It is relevant to the entire theme of the epistle, persecution, martyrdom, and death. It advises those who will be subjected to this persecution, martyrdom, or death not to be afraid. Give me a second here. So he says, fear not because the one who sends them this epistle and for whose sake they're suffering martyrdom and death is the one who became dead and lived again. In other words, what can they fear? Death, there is nothing harmful about death. They will resurrect by the power of the resurrected son and the word of God. St. Andrew of Caesarea writes, about this, and we said we will come to him very often because he is one of the most authoritative fathers of the church who talks about the book of Revelation. Quote, he says, as God, he is first. As human being, he is last. He is first because he is the one who, who existed before all things. He is last in the context of the human nature because he received the created human nature at a later times as last, eschatos in Greek, it's called eschaton, the last. In addition, the phrase, the first and the last, echoes the Alpha and the Omega, as he told us in the beginning of the book. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. This is in uh, chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 8. It contains everything that has a beginning and everything that has an ending. All of creation exists in God. And then he says, I know your works and your affliction and your poverty, but you are rich. This is very paradoxical. Initially, this may sound, of course, contradictory. How can you be rich and poor at the same time? I know your poverty, but you're rich. That doesn't make sense. Maybe someone who works on the Wall Street and who limits himself to financial matters and does not have any spiritual orientation whatsoever, one who who fails to recognize allegorical language, such one could say here, well, maybe he had money hidden somewhere, hidden treasure buried somewhere. Maybe the Lord is telling him, you're poor, but I know you're rich because you're hiding your money and you're hoarding it, I don't know, somewhere. 
Obviously, this is not the case here. You are poor. I know it. I know your works. Uh, Christ says to to send uh, to, to the bishop of Smyrna uh, through uh, Saint John. I know your affliction, your persecution. I know your poverty. Despite all this, I will show you that you are rich. Of course, he's not talking about material wealth. And here we're presented with the three-stranded robe that pulls the Christian on the journey to holiness. So today's topic will be, we'll talk about the voluntary poverty. And Father Athanasius has a very interesting approach to this. And I think it's very important to share. Father Athanasius asks, I will ask you for your complete attention here because this spells out the journey of the church and is very pertinent to the journey of the faith. I must also remind you to kindly acknowledge that what you will read in a moment is not for some other people out there, but will speak to all of us. It refers not just for the people at that time, on the first, the second, the third century, but also for the Christians who live in the 21st century. Let us now look into the uh, triple strand of works, affliction, and power. When the Lord says, I know your works, by works, he refers to the dynamic activity of the Bishop of Smyrna. Um, this uh, works include work of love and philanthropy, but also the works of Christ on earth. Interpreting only good works as philanthropy, by the way, is a very limited and narrow explanation. In the full sense of the word, works are the life and the conduct, conduct of the faithful. We need to know this because a specific individual may not have the means to give alms, money, pull strings, influence people in high offices and high places, I don't know, visit senators and government officials or solve people's problems and needs when they come to see him. One can be bedridden, a mere uh, servant, someone who is, let's say, on the periphery of the existence and be full of good works. Uh, what are these works? They're his life and his behavior, his conduct. The way he lives, the way he exists with his patience, endurance, faith, love, lack of grumbling, joy, regardless of pain and poverty, all these are also works. The Lord would tell us all someday, I know your works. What works? He will tell us, I know the way you lived, how you thought, how you talked, how you moved about, how you influenced other people. Because you see, everything has like a ripple effect. When we say some things to people, and let's say it's something harmful, it will ripple into that the soul, penetrate into the soul of that person, move on to another person, to another person. And that's why we need to be careful and choose our words, behavior, and so forth. One can be full of great feelings of philanthropy, but he may not be able to express them. Many times we see someone and we want to help them. We would love to help them, but we cannot. However, we can feel pain inside. So Nikolai Velimirovich, he says, very interestingly, he says, when you, um, when you cannot, uh, when you help someone, but you cannot help that person for whatever reason, let's say that person is, um, you're not in ability to help him, you can pray for him. If you cannot pray for him, then at least have good thoughts towards him. That's also some sort of a, a, a kind work towards those people. So we would love to help them but we cannot. However, we can feel pain inside. We can cry to God and pray to him. Lord, it is such a rough winter out there. It's so cold. And there are so many people who are homeless. They may live in tents or they may be earth, like earthquake weakness, like just what we have in Turkey and Syria, refugees, or their people are jobless. When the snow covers everything and the poor birds cannot find food, one who sees them can say, oh my Lord, this is all my fault. The poor birds suffer because of me, the human being. If men did not sin in paradise, creation would not have to suffer like this. I am at fault. This is how holy people think. Because they have acquired the pain, the, 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 the uh, prayer of pain for the whole world. Man is at fault for this difficult state of nature. Now tell me, Father Athanasius asked, aren't all these good works, these are expressions of philanthropy. A person can be open to his window and place a few crumbs on a windowsill or use a bird feeder and help the birds in times of deep snow. Aren't these expressions of a loving heart? We need not let our mind always turn to money when we talk about good works. Don't let your mind think that one must build hospitals and orphanages or give huge sums of money 
It is the life and citizenship of a person that matters. God knows the works of every person and of the church. The second strand in this threefold package is the affliction or persecution. This is the condition created by the contrary, um, uh, by the contrary and God opposing forces in the presence of God's works. It is the hate, jealousy, and the extreme opposition of Satan. When the devil and the servants of Satan see men doing God's works, they become full of hate. They attack him. They create situations and problems. It is this affliction that results from the attacks of the devil and the jealous and godless people that defines the affliction of the faithful. We need to understand this. Father Atanasio says, we have said before that it is impossible to be a true Christian and be without affliction. The Lord never gave us the assurance of salvation before our death like some sort of salvation certificate issued by some Protestant Sicarians. This is a heresy. The Lord's assurances in this world, you will have affliction. As a matter of fact, one of the fathers, he says, as the generals say, in generals say, in times of peace, prepare for war, so much so in times of tranquility for the church, in times of peace for the church, prepare for persecution. Now, what kind of affliction? It would not entail the affliction caused by our sins that would be worldly affliction. It would not mean to have affliction if, for example, my business failed, I'm afflicted by loss of money or loss of a career or because someone stole my car or my belongings or because I suffered damage from an earthquake or because a flood destroyed my farm, my cabin. All these afflictions are not in the name of God. These are everyday worldly afflictions and being distressed in this manner does not necessarily give me a ticket to the kingdom of God. However, if your affliction is related to the work of God because you live a godly life and this invites the hate, the jealousy, and the malice of Satan and God-opposing people, and if they then create difficulties and problems in your path, then you are blessed. So to expand on this, Father Athanasius says, when I suffer every day worldly distress, accidents, diseases, the loss of home to fire, the loss of a job, the loss of 10 acres of corn to drought, and I do not grumble, I do not curse God because of it, then this can turn into a blessing as well. We accept it as, as God's providence. So when I take even my mundane and worldly distresses patiently and do not grumble against God, then even this circumstantial and worldly stress takes on spiritual dimensions and counts as an asset in eternity. Likewise, grumbling, cursing at God, and blessing will also be accounted in eternity. Just wanted to remind you, the reason for that Anasius talks about cursing of God is that the communists and the Turks, but especially the communists, in a lot of the Balkan people kind of infected with uh, this kind of a cultural thing to, uh, with curses against God or the, or, or the saints or everything that we consider holy in order to minimize, in order to maliciously kind of miniaturize the importance of, of the saints and uh, the, the, holy, the holiness of life for the people in order to kind of suppress the, the, the influence of the church over people. So we now come to the third aspect of the Christian journey, which is poverty. Father Athanasius says, I will speak extensively on this and would like us to play to also to pay a close attention to this topic, the topic of the poverty, because there are two types of poverty. We'll see later why. So what is the meaning of poverty? Initially, it means material poverty. I will clarify this. It clearly means to lack material goods, to be poor. In the gospel, we come across two forms uh, or two expressions of poverty. The first is the seeking out of the poor and the provision of the necessary aid to the victims of this poverty. In other words, poverty is a sort of a social evil that needs to be cured, healed. St. James, the brother of God, writes, if a brother or a sister is naked and they even lack their daily food, if these brothers or sisters are cold, if they do not have, uh, meaning they do not have clothing, or if they are out of the cold and hungry, if they do not have their daily food, continues uh, uh, Apostle James, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, for the body, what does it profit? This is in James 2, 15 um, to 16. We may find ourselves saying, my friend, I feel bad for you. I feel sorry for you. I pray that God helps you and blesses you. 
We do not criticize this person. We don't ask him to leave. We are polite to him. We do not shut him out. We show compassion, but we do not give him anything either. We are not practical. We don't do anything to, to help this person. We let him go empty-handed. What is the use? St. James says this kind of religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. So do not only show compassion by words, but also make provision to heal and cure someone of the great needs and troubles created by poverty. What is significant is that the criterion of our entrance to the kingdom of God is love expressed in almsgiving. The Lord says, this is in Matthew 25, 35, for I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was, give me to eat, not meat. I'm sorry, that's a misspell. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in and so forth. These words of the Lord express the lowest step of love. However, their, experience, their expressions of love and they will be rewarded. These expressions constitute the criteria for judgment on the last day. So we conclude that we need to provide a cure for the social evil of poverty. Poverty uh, in and of itself is something evil. Poverty is a bodily evil. and It is the result of the ethical evil that we previously mentioned. The small birds suffer because I sin. And so through the disobedience of humankind, death and corruption entered nature and whole universe. Therefore, poverty is a result of the ethical evil, the distancing or alienation, if you will, of man from God, initially in the persons of Adam and Eve, and subsequently in the continued personal sins of their descendants. One day we'll talk about why, like a lot of atheists say, why did God have to punish us if Adam and Eve fell into sin? Why do we uh, uh, have, uh, they should, that's a very important question, we will answer it, we will have a special uh, topic to discuss only about this question, to explain why we also suffer from their sin. Why is passing on from generation to generation? Or at least the consequences of the sin. We'll, we'll talk about that. that. That's a very important topic because a lot of people like to use that against, uh, uh, against the Christians. Lack of, lack of rain, drought, and uh, fruitlessness of the earth are a curse, whereas fruitfulness of the earth is a blessing. The lack of fruitfulness of the earth, the lack of wheat or the lack of oil, is the cause of poverty, and it is not limited to specific country. In his case, Father Thomas said, let's say Greece or whatever. When drought afflicts the entire continent or the entire planet, then hunger takes on universal dimensions. This is a serious matter, and in those instances, we pray to God to put an end to this plague, this drought, this curse, etc. In the divine liturgy, as in the mystery of marriage, we pray for abundance of the fruits of the earth, for favorable weather, and so on. There are special services, for example, when in the times of drought, the bishop or the priest can do a special service to ask God to get some, uh, to send some rain for the nourishment of the of the land and so forth. In the sacrament of marriage, we pray for the uh, newlyweds to be blessed with earthly goods. We pray for this officially in the church. It is not a simple wish, but a prayer of the entire congregation, which prays to God to keep the pantry of the newlyweds filled so they do not lack anything. We ask for blessing to God. From all this, we see that the subject of poverty is a serious one. This is precisely why we pray to God for its extinction. We do not want this plague to exist. We do not need to use scripture verses to show that it is a plague. I will offer only, ref, uh, only refer to the fourth seal in the Revelation. This is in 6.8. At the opening of the seal, hunger prevails. And power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. Father Athanasius says, do we understand this? Authority is given for one-fourth of the earth to be killed. That one-fourth would be, what, if there are eight billion people, two billion people could at least die, maybe more. At the time of the writing of this book, uh, we have to remember, talking about the book of Revelation, we have to remember the weapons used for battle were the slingshot, the bow, and the arrow, and the spear. It would have been inconceivable that one-fourth of the earth would have been killed by these means. With the ve weaponry that we have stored today in different arsenals, not only one-fourth, but also the entire population of the earth could vanish, just the nuclear weapon and so forth. The population of all five continents could vanish from the face of the earth in the middle of a few hours. But Athanasius says, 
I say this because 2000 years ago, one could see these numbers, one quarter of the earth as an exaggeration. But by today's measures, one fourth of the earth does not seem much at all. It is really minimal that out of the four or five in his time, he says four or five billion, now we are eight billion people, seven to eight, one to one and a half billion would be die by sword. In our case, two billion people can die from the sword. Meaning, just here, almost did me. From uh, states of war, from hunger, and from the beasts of the earth. Incidentally, beasts are not only like the lion. When we get to these chapters, that's later in the revelation about the beasts we'll talk about, we will see that a beast can also be a virus or a pathogenic microbe. These are much more dangerous than the beasts of the field, like the lion or the leopard, or any kind of animal that we can imagine, or a dragon. The bottom line is that people will also die from hunger, and this is one of the seven plagues. On the other hand, one of the miracles of our Lord was the feeding of the 5,000 uh, in the desert. Doesn't the evangelist write, this is in Matthew 14, 20, and they did all eat and were filled, and they took up of the fragments that remain 12 baskets full. This shows bounty. The Lord said in the following verse from Mark 2, 8, 2, I have compassion on the multitude because they have not been with me three days and have nothing to eat. He also says on, on Matthew 15, 30, uh, 32 and Mark 8, 2, I think we'll read the Matthew 15, 32. He says, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and have nothing to eat and I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. So the Lord wanted to cure and to eliminate this evil from his brothers. This means that uh, when we, are, we see our neighbor in a state of poverty, we must help them. The other person must not be poor. At the very least, he should not be cold and hungry. However, there is another aspect of poverty, and this is very important now that we want to talk about, that we find in the gospel that is not considered an evil, but on the contrary, a blessing. In fact, in fact, it is a great blessing and a much uh, sought after blessing. The first link of the chain of the beatitude is the beatitude of the poor. If you remember in Matthew 5, 3, we said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, we have to just, uh, I'll, I'll just give a small uh, footnote here that is also in the book. It says, it is made clear that in the Greek, where the grammar allows for much more detail and accuracy, makari, or blessed, are the poor, topnevmati, makari eptohi topnevmati, means, in, not in the spirit as we translate in English, but by their own spirit, meaning, blessed are the poor who are poor by their own free will, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is a choice of this part. This is, so that's why in the Greek, uh, the translation, uh, the, the Greek original is more accurate than the English translation. This topnevmati, uh, who are poor in spirit, basically, in the Greek grammar is the third declension uh, of a noun, and it shows means. Nominative, topnevma, genitive, topnevmatos, dative, topnevmati, first, the spirit, second of the spirit, third, with, by, or through the spirit. The third case shows means by which something is done, meaning that poor this poverty is by choice. And we, I choose to be poor. That's the whole point. Most interpreters, when they look at this uh, verse of Matthew 5, 3, teach that poor in spirit are the humble. The poor in spirit are not only the humble, even though we may interpret this, beatitude, of course, to include the humble as well. If we take the time to closely study this beatitude, we will discover that this is not the central meaning of this verse. You may argue the point that there are a number of fathers who have spoken and written about the first uh, beatitude on the basis of humility, and this is true. But the Lancia says, I accept this. But I will also name you a number of fathers who have written and worked on this beatitude on the basis of poverty, simply poverty, and not humility or humble uh, spiritedness. It does not harm if someone takes this verse allegorically as well. Father Tanasia says, I will show, however, that the spirit of the verse is not about humility, but poverty, and that poverty is portrayed as a great and real blessing. Scripture refers to voluntary poverty and not humble-mindedness. Of course, humble-mindedness is crucially important. There is nothing without humility. But let's 
go deeper into this verse. That the poor are blessed becomes crystal clear in the words of our Lord to the wealthy young men. And this is in Matthew chapter 19, 21. Go, sell all your possessions, give it to the poor, and come and follow me. Simply put, do not be rich. Come and become poor. Stay poor. Give your possessions to the poor. We see here that the Lord encourages voluntary poverty. More importantly, importantly, when the Gospel of Luke records the Beatitudes, it does not even mention the word spirit. It simply says, blessed are the poor. And what is most significant is that St. Luke writes about the poor in the positive and the negative sense. Blessed are you, O poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. This is in Luke 6.20. Here we have the positive aspect. In verse 24, we have the negative aspect. This is in Luke 6, 24. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. You have this luxurious, luxurious lifestyle, your beautiful homes with all the uh, amenities, your expensive cars and boats, garment foods, and like the sort. You have received your consolation. We remember the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, verse 19 to 31. We have received on earth, but the poor did not, he tells to the rich man. And even his name is not even mentioned while Lazarus, we know him uh, by person. It makes no difference that poor Lazarus was in that state involuntarily. He did not linger at the rich man's doorstep for any reason other than to give him the opportunity for almsgiving. He did not abandon his wealth somewhere and take refuge at the rich man's doorstep to be licked by his dogs. Poor Lazarus was in great need, and he did not do this by choice. However, his poverty and the poverty of every poor person takes on spiritual dimensions when he does not grumble against God and does not complain. St. Luke does not end here. I will give an example about man who complained to God in his prayer that his cross was very heavy to bear. And that God should give him a smaller cross to carry. So one night, his angel guardian, in a dream, took him uh, in a huge, we call it etusa, huge room, huge hall, like a hangar, warehouse. And he, uh, this warehouse was filled with uh, crosses in different shapes and sizes. Huge, small, middle, and so forth. And while they were walking by the crosses, he asked the angel, what, are, what, is, what is the thing? Why are all these crosses? He says, well, each cross, he says, belongs to someone on earth. And he's carrying his cross. So those who have big cross, those are the people who suffer a lot. But they are carrying their cross. Those who have smaller have smaller issues. So while they were walking in this almost endless warehouse, he asked the angel, where is my cross? And so the angel took him at the very corner, at the very back of the warehouse. And in a very small spot, showing one almost like a one inch cross, small cross. He said, that's your cross. That's what God gave. And of course, this man was embarrassed. that He was asking God to remove the burden of the cross that he had in his life. Because he saw that almost every cross in that room was equal or much bigger than the other. So anyway, St. Luke continues in the verse 25, Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Here he talks about those who have full stomachs, not about those who are full of righteousness. Matthew says, blessed are those who are hungry for righteousness sake. It refers to voluntary poverty. So here in Luke we read, woe to you who are full, which certainly does not mean those who are full of righteousness. This would be nonsensical, of course. We believe the text to be quite clear. Woe to the rich who do not care that poverty may exist for others. Furthermore, we see that the apostles were very poor as they moved about the world. The apostle Paul tells us, and this is in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 to 10. As sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things, meaning, meaning possessing everything. We possess everything because we have Christ who supplies us with our needs, so it does not matter that we do not own anything. Here again, we need to stress two very basic points from the above. But Athanasia says, first, and I emphasize this, is the voluntary element of poverty to choose 
to be poor, even though I do not have to be. Let's be careful here. I do not enter into poverty by foolishness or stupidity. If I choose to gamble my money away or waste it in all alcohol, drugs, and the local pub, it is depravity. Instead, I stay poor for the sake of the gospel and the kingdom of God, not for the sake of my passions. I stay poor for Christ. This is a choice. The point is to choose this poverty for Christ's sake, poverty for Christ Jesus, for the sake of the kingdom of God. Involuntary poverty, which is different, forces poverty, uh, forced poverty is something bad and a very heavy burden. Voluntary poverty, but not for Christ, this is very important to differentiate, is poverty without meaning or purpose when it is motivated by philosophy, for example. Only voluntary poverty for Christ is what has value with eternal dimensions. This voluntary poverty for Christ has a great theological dimension, and we need to stay on this subject a little longer. The theological dimension is based on the following benefits to the Christians. First, it frees the wings of the soul for spiritual flight from the material weight of wealth. The church fathers stress that the inflow of blood of, or materials goes along with the outflow of the spirit. In other words, these are reversely proportional sums. The more money you try to make, the less spirituality you will keep. According to the words of the Lord, wealth and spirituality are not compatible. The rich man and the spiritual man are so incompatible that the Lord's word astonished the disciples when he stated in, in, this is in Matthew 19, 24, also in Mark 10, 25, in Luke 18, 25. He says, it is easier for a camel to enter through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. Incidentally, in ancient Greek, camel, the word camel, was also the name for the uh, thick ropes they used to, to, to tie ships on the, on the dock. Interpreters use both of the, uh, these possibilities when responding to disciples' astonishment. The Lord said, what is impossible with men is possible with God. He continues, this is Matthew 9, 27, Mark 10, 27, Luke 18, 27. Some rich people will enter the kingdom of God, just like Abraham and many others. But they're few, very few. The odds are dangerously low, and only the person who understands these realities of the gospel may be safe, even though he may be wealthy. Meaning, in other words, wealth itself is not sinful. What's sinful is the burden of the weight if it's not being distributed in a, uh, in, in a uh, um, Christian way. The second benefit deriving from the eternal theological dimension of spiritual voluntary poverty is that it is an invaluable guide and companion for one in spiritual life. St. Paul provides us with a wonderful picture of this uh, with what he says in Philippians. He was in jail in Rome when he wrote and could not work to earn a living. He previously worked with his hands as a tent maker because he was from Tarsus, if you remember. Now the Philippians sent him some money and he writes to them, why did you send me money? Okay, you did well because this shows the fruits of your spiritual life, but I have learned to be self-sufficient with the things I have. Self-sufficiency is a great thing to have in life. Be your own man. And the picture you have here is basically a picture of, of the moment of the tonsure into monasticism when the monks, when they receive a new name and they become married to the church uh, since that moment, they give uh, oaths uh, to God that they will live in celibacy for the rest of their life, they will live in obedience, and they will live in poverty. They will not possess anything but just the clothes that they have on themselves. This is the, the true original idea of the Christianity. So in Philippians 4.12, St. Paul says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. In other words, when I have plenty of food, I do not eat like a glutton. And when I'm hungry, I have learned not to blaspheme God, to say it's God's fault why I'm hungry or poor. I have learned the lesson to have plenty, to be rich without being attracted by and attached to these things. But I can also go hungry 
without doubting God and questioning what is going to happen to me, wondering whether God forgotten me or if God died and he's no longer here for me. No, St. Paul says, I have received full payment and more I am filled in 418. Holy St. Paul, uh, you're in jail. You've been in jail for three years, two years in Caesarea and now one year in Rome. What do you have? He says, I have everything and I abound. St. Paul is not lying. So do you see how a person can discipline himself, how he can be conditioned to be content and great, even in the moment of affliction like this, being three years in prison? Most of us are feeling uh, our children, let's say, with chocolate, ice creams, cakes, cream cheese, and so on on a daily basis. What is going to happen in the period of hunger, for the Tarnasia says, and this is very important, we need to teach the children to fast, to learn, even with all of today's technological advances, to endure some mild suffering so they might be able to survive some difficult days if they happen to come upon them. If they are trained in this way for the difficult days of their lives, like St. Paul, they will say, I know how to live with plenty, and I know how to survive without next to nothing. The third um, benefit from the theological dimension of voluntary poverty practice for Christ alone is that it establishes dependence on Christ at every moment. One learns to depend on the providence of God and so wipe out self-confidence and self-assurance. It is arrogant to say, um, I have plenty, I do not need anyone. I have a full refrigerator in my bank's account, bank account is full and so forth. Such self-confidence and self-dependence are forms of idolatry. We're not talking about social security and some provisions that are necessary to heal the involuntary poverty so that we do not have poor and destitute people. We're talking about the people who boast, I have everything. I have stocks, bonds, insurance policies, big balances in my bank accounts, and so forth. I have nothing to fear. It is a terrible thing to put your hope in pieces of paper. Christians must learn to depend on God. One who is voluntarily poor has no choice but to put all his trust in God. When he's in a tough situation, he says, God did not die. He's watching out for me. He's watching over me. The Lord is my shepherd. He quotes Psalm 23, 1, so forth. The man who is confident in his net worth says, so what if God dies? Of course, he's, Father Athanasius is referring to his, the Nietzsche, God is dead, who, who said. That's the nihilism and the existentialism we experience today. So what if God does not exist? I don't care. I've got the money. He depends on himself. The fourth benefit from the theological dimension of the voluntary poverty of Christ is that it makes the faithful place his hope in heavenly wealth. My hope is not in earthly riches, but I stay poor, and in this way I transfer my wealth to heaven. When I give up my riches to Christ, I transfer them to heaven, whereas the richest, rich man of this age does not transfer anything to heaven. Remember the words of the Lord, and you will see that this is the meaning of do not store up treasures on earth. This is on Matthew uh, 6. Uh, nine, he does not suggest for us not to have some economic base, somewhat, some, uh, something, something saved for a time of need for a rainy day. But he does not say, uh, but he does say not to treasure hunt. Do not have in Matthew six nineteen he says, do not have your hope in your earthly wealth where moth and rust destroy, but store up your treasure in heaven where there is no danger of it being stolen by thieves. They cannot, be, uh, uh, they cannot break in there, the, the kingdom of heaven. There is no rust, no moths, no treasury of heaven is forever safe and it ever earns interest. The bank of heaven pays great interest, great dividends, if we only knew. It is the very thing that the Lord directed us to do, to make friends with the mammon of righteousness. But Athanasius says, give alms before you leave this life so that when you go there, these friends will welcome you in Luke 69. What he means by this is that I will receive my capital there with interest. I will have wealth there. St. Paul writes to, the, to those Christians who lost all their belongings when their properties were seized because of persecution by the anti-Christian authorities. St. Paul says in Hebrew 10.34, you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your belongings. What strange behavior. Who feels joy when their belongings are being confiscated or stolen? Here is the secret. And this is again from 10.34. Knowing that you have earned for yourself 
much better and lasting possession stored in heaven. And knowing this, you are not saddened. So do we have to see this voluntary poverty for Christ leaves a man feeling joy in the most adverse condition. His hope is not in his possessions, but in his God. But Athanasius continues, the fifth benefit from voluntary poverty for Christ is that makes the faithful person flexible and very receptive to the Christian confession, mission, and martyrdom. The one who burns with faith for Christ does not think about financial statements. He sacrifices everything in a heartbeat. You know how difficult this can be for someone who needs a large income, who has amassed great wealth, who can... Uh, uh, who, uh, how can he suddenly confess Christ? Uh, we see this every day as we Christians have become accustomed to staying silent, more silent than fish, because we do not want to make waves. We do not want to have any negative repercussions in our personal interest, meaning our income-producing abilities must continue. Nevertheless, when you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to fear, so we can easily undergo martyrdom. You will truly be as free as a bird. You will have a tremendous flexibility when you choose not to have possession. The sixth benefit for cultivating voluntary poverty for Christ, and let's, Father Athanasius says, let's please, please pay attention to this one, is that poverty is the denial of the recreation and remodeling of a very old world, a world that will vanish in its present form. None of it will be left when we enter the new world of the kingdom of God. Nothing at all. Not our homes, offices, farms, or boats. Absolutely nothing. Look at what, uh, San, uh, the, what the apostle says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 7, 30 to 31. Let's see if I have here the... No, I don't have it. I'll just read it for you. But this, is, but this I tell you, my brothers, because time has been shortened. So those who buy as though they had no goods and those who deal with the world as though they were not engrossed in them. We can use the things of this world. We will use uh, the technology or watch, the bus, electricity, and so forth. But let's be careful. Let's not get attached to these things. Let's not... Uh, 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 Partake on them thinking that we possess. You buy, I don't know, a car, I don't know, Tesla, and, and you somehow identify yourself with that. It becomes, it becomes your little idol, your love. We will simply use them because the form of this world is passing. So why should we go out and work, 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 buy, build, invest? What for? First, death is just around the corner. Even in the absence of death, I must wonder about what I am striving for. I need to find meaning in all of these actions. What am I going to gain? I will gain nothing more than an old world, a world on its last legs, a world that will burn up. This world will be replaced by a new world with a new form and a new dimension. This world will be the kingdom of God. Every old thing will be renewed, everything as we know it. This is why the man who chooses voluntary poverty is exceedingly theological. He considers all these things. And finally, the last benefit is even more profound. Voluntary poverty makes the faithful similar to the one who became poor voluntarily. And who became poor voluntarily other than Christ our God? God becomes poor because men became poor through sin. Now men emulating God who became poor by his incarnation becomes wealthy. And this is in 2 Corinthians 8 to 9. Where it says, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for, our, for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might become rich, be rich. So man becomes an imitator of God. We truly see this dimension through the gospel, all around the gospel. This is how all the saints live, where the saints, if not uh, what are the saints, if not the iconography of the gospel or the gospel in moving pictures, the gospel in action? This is the work of the saints. They are those who fulfill the, the commandments of Christ. They, they're, they're the real example of Christ among living among us at this present age. 
Do you have a hard time understanding the gospel? Then read the life of a saint and you will see the gospel in action. Just like in past times when the people could not read and did not have access to books long before the printing press. The dogmatic teachings of our church were all over the walls of a church and icons in fresco. One can find the entire service of salutations, the ones that we serve here on Friday, for example, on the walls of a church. And through this, the people were able to understand orthodox dogma. In a similar way, just as icons have been used to teach the gospel, the gospel in application is seen in the lives of the saints. St. Paul provides us with a wonderful presentation regarding both of these forms of poverty. Involuntary as something evil that needs to be healed and dealt with. And voluntary is something good that needs to be sought out, in essence, the theology of poverty, the poverty of Christ, for Christ. You may want to look into both of these chapters in your daily reading time. This is 2 Corinthians chapter 8 to 9. Today, more than ever, Father Athanasius says, we live in a time of comfort and secularization. And we talked about secularization yesterday when we were referring to the text of uh, Metropolitus Eurotheos uh, Vlachos. The spirit of this age is living for the day, carpe diem. What counts is now, eat, drink, be merry, make money, enjoy it any way you can. Life is short and you would be stupid if you don't take advantage of the opportunities to become wealthy. It is precisely because this spirit of comfort and material success captivates them that the Christians of our day fail to see the value of voluntary poverty for Christ. Do they understand this or do they only want to see this poverty lived by the clergy? Um, you know, Father Athanasius says, uh, many of our people like to have their priests be very poor. They do not want their priests to have many possessions, and they certainly don't want to see them with much financial success. The minute the priest buys an expensive car, an apartment, or whatever, uh, the news travels as the speed of light. And this is, today, gossip may even take on an international dimensions thanks to the internet because of all of this. Our people want our priests to be poor, and they respect and honor the poor priest. Do we see the double standard here? The laity loves to have a poor priest, but they themselves do not want to hear about voluntary poverty for Christ. These are the words of Father Athanasius, not mine. Well, this is kind of ridiculous that we want our priests poor, and perhaps that is uh, commendable. But why just the priest? Do we have one gospel for priests and a different gospel for lay people? The gospel is for everyone. The gospel is the same for all. The reason, Father Athanasius says, why we don't understand Christianity today is precisely because we fail to understand the concept of voluntary poverty for Christ. This is not an exaggeration, he says. I repeat, today people do not understand Christianity because they fail to see the point. And since they do not see this point, they do not understand the mystery of the incarnation. It seems strange to them, and they feel the same about the mystery of the cross. All these things remain not only mysteries, but sealed mysteries, since they do not comprehend the mystery of the incarnation or the mystery of the cross. They find themselves denying Christ and the cross. This is the cause of the denial, because these mysteries are incomprehensible to the Christians of comfort. We're talking about eternal truths here, and you may be thinking, uh, could, uh, but could you do get with the uh, something different in the years? We're almost... He says in the year 2000, uh, we need to be more realistic. And we're now in the first 2023. Of course, Father Athanasius says the gospel is always contemporary. We cannot say that there was a different gospel since the first, the fifth, the eighth, the 11th century, and now in the 21st, some, some, something else. The gospel does not get old. There are no old fashioned ideas in the gospel. The gospel, the gospel itself, it's life. The gospel does not respond to fashions and fads. This is why we suffer today. If we contract a disease, we want to get well. We must find the cause. Do we say, no, we do not want to use penicillin because it is not very modern, because it was invented many, many decades ago. The medicine is always the medicine. If it cures and it gets people well, then the age is irrelevant. Are we going to stop drinking water just because it is old as creation? No. Water does not get old-fashioned because it can quench thirst like nothing else. So if water does not get old, then the living water, the gospel does not get old as well. Finally, the standard of voluntary poverty for Christ is the very thing that St. Paul tells us uh, so that we will not be alarmed. 
Great wealth is the combination of piety with self-sufficiency. In 1 Timothy 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 6 to 9, St. Paul says, The reason, uh, but godliness with contempt is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with contempt. This applies to all Christians, clergy, and laity alike. And even though this is the minimum level of our sacrifice and offering, it is a good starting point for every Christian. Exactly this type of poverty, the voluntary poverty, combined with distress and works, was the wealth of the Bishop of Smyrna that was praised by Christ. Despite all the wealth of the city, the bishop chose, chose to be very poor. Smyrna is a city, had great wealth, but its bishop lived the voluntary poverty for Christ. That was his wealth. And Father Athanasius says, may God uh, uh, give us this wealth to be our wealth as well. And here we will stop. You see, I would just like to add another thing at the end. And to some of you, I have told you this, but I want you to, I will repeat myself, because sometimes... We indeed live in this world in the denial of the cross. And uh, when the real persecution comes to choose between the world and Christ, if we don't practice our faith here, we, will, we can easily lose ourselves. We can easily fall. For that reason, I'll tell you the example that uh, uh, it's in the book of uh, uh, St. Paisius. There was this man <clears throat> who asked uh, uh, Saint Paisius, wanted to come to ask Saint Paisius, who uh, had a friend who was ill in a hospital, dying, and uh, he wanted to learn from Saint Paisius how can he pray so God can listen to his prayer because he heard about Father Paisius, the Gerunda that is very popular and that he uh, prays, he's a monk, but God listens to him. A lot of people got healing and so on and so forth. So one day he came and he tried to talk to him, but getting the pieces ignored him almost all day. He didn't want to talk to him because uh, probably he didn't want to have that conversation with this man because the outcome would have been very difficult to accept. So anyway, this man was very persistent towards the end of the day. Okay, finally, my friend, uh, I can tell you how to pray and God will listen to your prayer and your friend will be well. But I'm not sure if you can accept this, because what I'm about to tell you is so serious that there is no coming back from this. I said, do you still want to learn how to pray so God can listen to your prayer? I said, yes, get on that. I want to learn. So he said, well, tonight when you go home and you uh, do your prayer rule, and when you say a prayer for your friends who is lying in a hospital, his friend was, by the way, dying from a serious disease. I don't know if it was cancer or something. It doesn't matter. The doctors gave up on him and said, now only miracle can help. And that's why this man wanted to pray for him. He says, when you start with your prayer rule, just say this to the Lord. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me, a sinner. Take away the illness from my friend and give it to me so he can get well. And then when he said this to him, uh, of course, the man was kind of struck by this because this is not an easy thing to digest. Now, you know, I don't know how many of us are truly prepared, let's say, if you want to pray for someone who has a cancer to ask God, God, give me his cancer to me so he can get well, I will die. Because St. Paisius told him, my friend, the moment you pay, you pray to God with pain in your heart, like this, in sincerity, God will listen to your prayer. Sure. It only depends whether you're ready to pray like this or not. Because true prayer is a prayer of compassion when we pray with pain for the other. When we choose to be poor for the others. When we choose to um, voluntarily suffer because of the other. In that moment, we actually fulfill what Christ says. There is no greater sacrifice than for a man to give his own life, to sacrifice his own life for his brother. And uh, even though we know theoretically this very well, and we really kind of like to talk about this, it's a beautiful concept and so forth, and we like to 
um, parade, if you will, sometimes with all these words and the wisdom of Christ. Only a few of us are truly ready to, to pray like this. And that is why even St. Paisius, he himself died from cancer. He was asking God to give him cancer because he thought that dying from this illness would have been a form of new martyrdom. He said, he used to say that if people uh, now are not able to have the martyric death like they used to have in the first centuries in the times of the communism and so forth, because he lived in Greece at the time, at least God allows some people to have cancer to kind of give them a form of martyrdom, to save them like that. It's hard to comprehend, it's hard to process all of these things, but I agree with Father Athanasius, who, who says that most of us misunderstand the concept of Christianity. And that's why people today mold the Christianity away in the way that they want to experience it, not the way it is. Of course, Christ is not a socialist. Christ is not a communist. Christianity is not an ideology. And for that reason, when we say that wealth uh, is dangerous, we say it is dangerous. It doesn't mean that people who are wealthy cannot be saved. We had a lot of wealthy people, like Father Athanasius says, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, many others. Joseph, also from Egypt. Uh, and later on, we have wealthy people. But St. John Chrysostomos says, you who are wealthy, you should utilize your wealth to be able to help the poor and to put that wealth into action in an intelligent way. And you who are poor, do not grunge and slander against the wealthy, but be thankful to God that you have them so that you can put table on your uh, uh, food on the table. So that in that kind of way, the wealthy and the poor, they're both wealthy in despair. In that way, it's kind of uh, important to understand the deep meaning of, of the, the voluntary poverty that uh, this Bishop of Smyrna was, was living into, even though he lived in abundance of a city that was very, very wealthy and a lot of Christians who joined were among them were wealthy and so forth. Okay, guys, we'll stop here at 7.15. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and we'll, we'll talk. If not, we can maybe wrap it up for tonight. And God willing, we'll uh, continue next uh, Monday and Tuesday. Father, quick question. Yes. Um, if the child doesn't want to hear about anything, uh, you know, let's say child 17 years old and um, you're trying to explain you're trying to come up to it and say hey listen here is the christian life supposed to be or you even start to, to talk is it worth to push the child to <laughs> kind of work with them that that way that doesn't want to hear anything i mean it's just or, or should sh should the parent then let it go for some time and uh just you know let it be that way I have two, what, two. What is the easiest way? The easiest way is to follow the advice of Saint Porphyrios, who said that we should talk to God more about our kids, meaning to pray for them, than to talk our kids to talk to our kids about God. Okay. And Saint Seraphim of Sorrow, he says, we should first work on ourselves, and if we acquire. Uh, um, the inner peace, thousands around, around us shall be safe without even having been able to speak a word. Meaning that we, the best way to talk to our children is through personal example and to pray for them. Because the prayer of the parent, uh, of the mother and of the father, ascends very, very fast and very, very high on the throne of God. Why is this important? Because, you know, uh, we cannot impose our free will or, or our intentions uh, on our children. The best way to help our children is to love and understanding and to let them know that uh, we as parents are always there for them, but not to impose, to force them to, let's say, let's say to force our kids to go to church. That's kind of nonsense. Why would we force them? They should know that they should come to church. But for whatever reason, let's say, if they were not kind of into it and so forth, the best thing is to pray for them. Pray for them, sincerely pray for them, 
and ask God to interfere and intervene very, very seriously into this. Only then I know that God will help. I have seen that in many examples. But I would say uh, if we start living seriously Christian life, that eventually that will be passed on onto our children as well. If we live a life of decadence, if we live a life of disharmony, <coughs> passionate and so forth, then it will, those sins will be passed on to, to our children as well. That's why that's a topic that we're going to discuss, God willing, one of our following catechism classes or the, or the Bible studies about the, the sin. Why? Why, does, uh, why do we have to die, uh, experience pain and suffering because of the sin of Adam and Eve? Because of their disobedience. And that also talks about uh, the, the passing of the sins from parents to their children, from their children to their grandchildren, and so on and so forth. But above all, Alexander, the thing is to not to impose ourselves on their children, respect their freedom, as long as that freedom is not harming them, because not every freedom is a true freedom. So I, I hope it makes sense to uh, remember first thing what St. Porfirio says to. Talk to God about your children more than to talk to your children about God, if that makes sense. Yes, it does. Of course it does. Okay. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Okay. Um, Mark, you don't have any questions. It's kind of weird. You always... Uh, Hear yes, something. I'll have one for you, Father, if you need okay. one. <laughs> yes, I read your mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, um, for me, um, something you said very early um, about the, the idea of even having a kind of a compassion for the creation, um, like the birds, like part of it is because of the fall, and, and we take a little bit of responsibility for that. Uh, that was really kind of a something I've thought of, but I thought it was kind of extreme. But now I think about it, it, it it's good to know that um, that's more close to the truth than just simple, you know, goodwill towards creation. It's actually part of the divine economy. Oh, yes, we will be, Mark. Uh, I, I, when I was, uh, when I went to my first confession, I, I can disclose this with you because I was a child and I told the priest, I want to confess that when I was like probably, I don't know, uh, first grade or something with my cousin, we used to kill ants with the, with a monocle, you know, uh, right. Burn them. And I know that later on, I felt so sorry that I, I killed ants with but like that. Uh, it was a grave sin. And I had to confess this because we will be all accountable for, for things like that. Uh, I know it's funny, but, uh, but you know as kids you don't think about those things you don't know about those things we uh are responsible for all of the creation as well because god has created us according to his image of likeness and he's created man to be a crown of his creation to be not just a governor not to be exploiter of the nature but to become a priest of everything that is created and that is why when the priest is serving the liturgy or the bishop, he says, Dayon of Dayon, we offer unto thee for everything and for all. We're not only praying for ourselves and for the, the congregation, let's say. When we say the Catholicity of the church, we pray for everything that is, because everything, for everything that exists, because uh, uh, God created everything and everything was good. It only later became corrupted because of our uh, cho uh, choosing so when we pray we offer back to god and when the, the 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 second coming of christ will happen there will be what we call the great transfiguration of everything of the nature as well that uh, the trees the animals uh, the planets the stars they are all eager in their anticipation of the general resurrection of the dead and of the second coming of christ so they can come into the fullness of their existence to be what they're created to be because they also suffered with our fall they also uh, suffered they also lost grace because we lost grace and we were evicted from 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 uh, paradise 
So now with Christ that everything is changing and with the second coming will be changed. There was one interesting uh, comment by one ascetic father. He lived in the desert. So some philosophers came to him and they said to him, well, why are you living in the desert? Won't you think that with your experience, your wisdom, your prayer can be more useful if you lived in the world and teach people how to pray and you can be living, maybe working in a hospital and so on, do some social work. Here, you say that uh, you pray for the whole world, you pray for the people, but you can't see even one face of a human being for, for years because you live by yourself. So who do you love here if you don't have humans, if you're by yourself? He says... The birds, I love the birds. I love the snakes. I love everything that is around me. Meaning, in, in a very mystical way, he wanted to say that all of the creation is human-like. When you look at the eyes of a bird, when you look at the eyes of a dog or, or a cat or, or, I don't know, a camel or, or an elephant or a tiger or a lion and so forth, you see how they look like us. God created them to be human-like, not like Darwin wants to teach us that uh, we are animal-like or ape-like, that we allegedly came out from apes and whatever, monkeys. No, the apes are human-like. And that is why we're responsible for, for, uh, for them as well. I hope it makes sense. Yes, it, it, it reminds me of that well-known verse. I think it's in uh, Romans 8, 8 or 9 about the whole gr creation groaning, waiting yes. for the sons of God to be revealed. Um, yes. yes, Yeah, so thank St. you for that. St. Joseph the Hesychus, just to add this, St. Joseph the Hesychus writes to one of his uh, uh, spiritual children, he says to me, come, come here, my child, come to Mount Athos with me among the rocks and the, and the sea beneath them. And you will see that here, even the rocks are uh, how they become the greatest theologians in their silent awaiting of the coming of the Lord. Hmm. And wow. that's profound because he's talking that even the rocks, the, what we call the empsicha and the amsicha of the world, the living and the non-living, that even the rocks there have their own life. And they're also in the anticipation of, of, of the coming of Christ. That everything that's created, it's not dead just because it's static. It's very much alive, and even more alive will become truly alive in the, in the second coming of Christ. That is why that's the, the most important event of, of everything that ever happened, the second coming of Christ, the second parousia. Okay, uh, that will be all at 7, uh, 7.30 almost, so maybe we can um, uh, finish for tonight. Let's say the prayer, and uh, we'll see each other, God willing, tomorrow evening. Just wanted to let you know. We have a uh, pre-sanctified liturgy from 5.45. We have every day in the morning, we have the Lenten hours uh, from Monday to Friday. Friday evening, we'll have, of course, the paraclesis with the Akathist and uh, Sunday, Saturday, Vesper Sunday liturgy as usual. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our holy fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen.